Dean. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Sir Patrick, for being here today. Um, I have two broad areas of question. One is around data and one is around schools. Um, on the data side of things, I've had a lot of scientists, a former scientist myself, um, asking me why we aren't releasing open data on everything we yeah. possibly can, given the number of brilliant brains, not just in academia, but also in business, who are, uh, for, I use a phrase someone shared with me the, the other day, chomping at the bit to try and help and, and look at the modelling. I was just interested to get your view on why that hasn't happened and, and what will be happening on that front. I think there may be two bits to that question. Yeah. Um, in terms of the data, I think the data is being released by PHE and NHS, and those, those mm -hmm. are the data which everybody are using, and they're data collected from around the world. And then there's a second question about the modelling. Yes. Um, the modelling, we uh, clearly it's been rather fast-moving. We've had all sorts of different modelling things that have gone along, and then uh, Neil Ferguson released his paper yesterday, and we're releasing um, the modelling that's been done and, and the various uh, other parts of the science input to SAGE uh, this week uh, to try and get that out in the public domain. But the data, I, I think in terms of the... Um, multiple brains on it is the data access which is important and that data access needs to work well it needs to be open it needs to allow people to sort of crunch the numbers and come up with the answers that they come up with the models and the codes will be made public by um by sage and by by the academic groups that are doing it i mean it's not a government organization that's doing it. it's the academic groups that are doing the modeling and that gets that that will be released and in terms of that, is there just uh, one of the other questions I've had, and this might be a naive question, but is the modelling that we're using in the UK the same modelling that's being used throughout the world, as given it's a global pandemic? Is everyone using the same approach? And if so, why, why in some cases do we seem to be making slightly different um, decisions from other countries? Um, I think modellers are using, I mean, as always, they use different models depending on you know, what they think are the most important variables to put in and how they treat those. I do know that the modellers that we use are being used by others as well and in quite a lot of demand so that um, other countries have either used the modelling that's been done here or asked the modellers to be involved in things. So I don't think there's any great difference in terms of um, how modellers have approached this but some countries have got fewer modellers and some have got more and the UK mm -hmm. happens to be a country which has got extremely strong science right the way across the board including in modelling and, and regarding that modelling side of things you know we've seen during elections in so many different areas that data is used across um, both for predicting disease and so on but also can be used to identify vulnerable areas vulnerable people perhaps older people in certain areas is there a, is there a plan to start to look at this in a slightly different way where we can predict where potential um, vulnerable people might be so that we can ensure that volunteer networks and support is given to them ahead of time? I think, I think that... Um, I, I know that, for example, um, GHSC are, are using the data they've got to try and understand the most, where the most vulnerable people are in order to make sure they get the specific advice they need. And so I think that will happen, I guess, within, within the department and within the NHS... Um, I think the other question for modelling going forward is to what extent it can help um, understand where capacity is being reached and where therefore there are more stringent interventions that might need to take place in one area or another in order to manage this. And I think this is going to have to be an actively managed process to keep on top of it, which means I come back to my two points, that testing and data flows are going to be critical to get this right. And um, thank you. And, and on the school side of things, because this seems to be the biggest topic in uh, many MPs' um, uh, casework and inboxes, can you just give a? I understand that closing schools might mean that children then have to be looked after by grandparents and so on. But what I'm hearing is that this is already happening, but on a lower level already. For example, I was told a story uh, just this week where one school is testing the temperature of children as they walk in the door. If their temperature is too high, the parent then has to literally find somewhere for them to be looked after. In many cases, that is grandparents. So could you just give a really clear view on, on why schools aren't closing now, why we're doing it differently from other countries, which seem to be quite uh, commonly closing uh, schools, and if schools are to be closed, um, what the plans are around that? When we looked at all of the interventions, we looked at the ones that had the biggest impact first, albeit with the variability that we talked about, 
and um, those that have less effect. And school closing was definitely a bit lower down the list than some of the ones that we've announced. It doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. It would have an effect. Um, but it has all sorts of complicated effects as well, including the one that you mentioned of uh, potentially leading to uh, children being with grandparents and so on, and um, of course also causing an enormous problem not just for the workforce generally, but for the workforce in the NHS as well. So it's a complicated one, and um, all I can do is give the sort of science advice on that um, in terms of the effect. I think as you look across the world, for example, Singapore hasn't closed schools. It's introduced some different measures in schools. Taiwan, I think, didn't close schools in, in, in managing this. So there's been a variability across the world in terms of school closures and whether that's been part of the approach or not. It's absolutely on the table, as the whole suite of measures are. The evidence base is there to suggest where it might work and where it doesn't work. And decisions will, I'm sure, be made at the time they need to be made around school closures, which is one of the things, one of the levers to pull to try to, uh, to get on top of this at the right time. But I say it's not without quite complex uh, consequences. Yeah. And just on that, two more br brief questions, if that's OK. Um, one is around school children. I, I have a daughter myself. Um, a lot of kids are talking around this. They're not, um, uh, you know, they're not ignorant uh, of the situation. And one of the concerns also is around mental health, um, around children, how they're being taught about this in schools. Um, you know, they're worried that they're going to give they, their grandparents something that could uh, potentially harm them. Is there any uh, discussion around mental health around this? Of course, physical health yeah. is absolutely key, but mental health and the concern of the repercussions of this over the coming months and years could be quite high. I think that's one of the big worries. I mean, we need to remember that um, the health service is going to be under pressure during this process, and uh, there will be the direct illnesses and um, tragic outcomes relating to the virus there'll be the indirect due to the fact that other people may not be able to get the care at the time that they need and there will be the consequences on things like loneliness, on people feeling isolated, uh, on um, people not being able to get enough exercise and the other things they might want to do to keep themselves healthy and mental health is definitely part of that. So I, I don't think, and that's why you know, when we look at the measures that were announced yesterday, that is a very substantial set of measures with a lot of consequences. And it's why also this is something for all of us. It's our ability as a society to help each other during this time, which is going to be incredibly important. And I think that's where we will see a lot of people wanting to help, to help in order to try and get through this. But it's, it's not an easy situation and it's going to go on for some time. And very finally and very briefly, um, in terms of schools, I imagine you must have talked at some point about schools potentially closing. Um, yes. If that were to be uh, advised, do you foresee it being an overnight decision, in which case tomorrow morning children won't be going to school, or would it be uh, a staggered thing so teachers, parents and children get a chance to adjust and, and know what their plans will be so that kids aren't just given to grandparents, as it were? I think that's a decision for ministers to take mm -hmm. as to how they would... Um, make a decision about closing schools and in what way they would choose to do it. Okay. Thank you.